in the flesh. All right, so quick review. Matthew presented Jesus as what? As king of kings, all right, as the descendant from Abraham. He was the king. Mark presents him as the servant of man. All right, he's always doing, going. It was, it was, and then and immediately, then and immediately. Then we see in Luke, we saw the humanity of Jesus, the Son of Man. <coughs> While still the Son of God, Luke shows his his humanity and his touch among the people. Now we get to John and we're going to see the Son of God. The fact that John is establishing God and Jesus are one, and he's going to make that crystal clear. Um, that is his purpose for writing, that you'll believe that he indeed is the Son of God. And that is the key theme and purpose. The outline there from Wearsby um, talks about the opportunity, the opposition, the outcome. And it's a simple outline that gives you some uh, chapters to hang some things on that we will not follow. Uh, but it gives you a good outline for an overview. All right, so let's dive into this book, chapter 1 of John 1, because the first 18 verses set the stage for this book. And in fact, the whole thing hangs on these 18 verses. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So these first 18 verses of John do indeed set the stage for the entire book. My point number one is the Son of God is eternal. The Son of God is eternal. Number A there is, whereas Matthew traced Jesus from Abraham, as you recall, because Matthew is a very Jewish-centered book trying to present Jesus as the Messiah King, it started from Abraham, all right, and it proceeded. Then we saw Luke, because of his emphasis on Christ's humanity, his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam, all right? So we have Adam as the first man, and then Luke traces uh, genealogy either slightly different than the one in Matthew, or it was actually tracking Mary's genealogy um, in, in the Gospel of Luke. Well, when we get to John, he starts from eternity past, okay? So John's going to take us back, and he's going to go back to eternity past, before any creation has occurred. And he goes back to, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, let me tell you something. That verse is so crystal clear that people like the Jehovah's Witness literally take and retranslate the verse because they don't want to acknowledge that Jesus is God, all right, because they don't believe it. All right, so I always, I get a Jehovah's Witness, I always just, I keep banging on the fact of all the verses that Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He is indeed God in the flesh, all right? And by the way, my conversation ends with them very soon because they, they don't believe Jesus is God. So their translation, their own, I think it's called New World Translation, says Jesus was a son of little g God. All right? This is a crystal clear, in the Greek, it is God. It is not a God. All right? It is a total, uh, uh, 
total misconstruing in order to add that a God to it. All right? It's deliberate because it's false teaching that corresponds with the rest of their false teaching. But here's the thing. Verse number one is not their only problem in John, as we're going to see, because the whole book is telling us that Jesus is God. All right? So you can put a God in and make it a little G. It doesn't solve the problem with the rest of the book hammers to this point home, which we will look at over the next two weeks. All right, so the blank there is it went, went all the way back to Adam on Luke. Um, number B there, this word that is created is the creative agent of Genesis 1. So when it talks about all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. All right, Colossians states it like this. Well, first let me read Psalm because I like reading that Old Testament passage first. Psalm 33, listen to this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. We see God spoke. The creative agent is the word itself, all right? Then we see in Colossians, talking about Jesus in very specific, Paul says it this way. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have, be, have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and, all, and in him all things hold together. Then Hebrews 1 says it this way, In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. All right? So Jesus is equated with the Word, which is equated with the Word is the creative agent that God uses to create the whole universe. All right? You with me? So we have Old Testament, we've got New Testament, we have the Gospel of John, and then number C, the Word of verse 1, which is equal with God, becomes flesh and dwells among us in verse 14. All right, so take a look at verse 14, and what does it say? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. All right, what is that Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us? And we saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, to make it crystal clear. John the Apostle says, And John the Baptist testified about Him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I have said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. All right? John the Baptist was born three months prior to Jesus Christ. In a physical sense, he was born and he says he existed before me. John the Baptist knows what we're talking about is the eternal God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. All right? The mystery of the incarnation. One reason that I listen to Christmas messages in the middle of July is not because I used to be in retail and we ran Christmas in July sales, the worst hook ever, but because I, the glory of the incarnation sometimes gets lost in the Christmas shuffle sometimes, and I see and hear new things when I listen six months later, all right? The fact that God takes on human skin and comes to live a perfect life to die on the cross of Calvary in my place for my nasty sin and pays the price and then hands me his perfect record. Only God. This is not a story man would make up. All right? Only God could have this glorious of a story. So, we see the Son of God is eternal. Then, number two there, the Son of God is the Lamb of God. So in Psalm, or in verse, uh, John 1, verse 29, it talks about John the Baptist was baptizing in verse 28 in Bethany beyond the Jordan. By the way, when I take you to Israel, I will take you to, depends, one of two baptismal sites. If we go to Jordan also, I'll take you to the one that I think is much more authentic. If I take you to, only to Israel, I'll go to the one that's the biggest commercial enterprise you've ever seen. All right, renting robes for 10 bucks and a towel, and the gift shop is like, I, the retailer in me goes, wow. Okay, I want to be the, I want to own this caboose. I want to run this gift shop, all right, because this is a good one. Uh, so, the Jordan River, right? The Jordan River, 
running from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. All right? So it actually starts up here. But that is called the, the rift. It's the Jordan Valley Rift. All right? And this is where, when we get to the Dead Sea, we're 1,350 feet below sea level, lowest place on earth. All right? So that river is where the Jordan, this fresh water that flows here, Jesus is baptized down here near, in that area, near Bethany. Um, now, with this said, the Son of God is the Lamb of God, is what he proclaims in verse 29, me, he being John the Baptist. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right? Jesus is, not only is he the Son of God, but he is the Lamb of God. He is the sacrifice that is going to be the end all, that is going to be the culmination, the ultimate fulfillment of the sacrificial system that God had established in order to deal with our sin problem. So the blank there is sin. He is the ultimate fulfillment of that sacrificial system. Then John goes on to testify in verse 32, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. All right? So John testifies at the baptism, and you recall at the baptism from our other uh, times in the Gospels, in our previous three, he's baptized, and not only does the dove light, but a voice from heaven booms up and says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All right? So John testifies, this is indeed the Son of Almighty God. Then, in verse 35 through about 51, it talks about uh, Jesus and calling some of the disciples. By the way, in John, we actually see some new information. We don't have time to look at all of it. But we see where he actually, the disciples are called to follow him. And they follow him, and then they went back to, in other words, they followed him for a time while he was doing some ministry, and then he calls them officially, and then they, they leave their nets and follow. In other words, we see that some of the calling, like when we saw earlier, it says, he called them and said, come follow me, and they drop their nets and go, is he already had some relationship with them. All right, so they knew who he was, and John gives us some of that detail that we don't see in the synoptics. All right, so in uh, this little passage, he calls Nathaniel, one of the... Uh, disciples. And verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus and answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So here we see that the Son of God is omniscient. All right? Now, he saw Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree without being in the area to see. He described it, and Nathaniel went, Whoa. Okay? Because nobody would know where that particular fig tree was. It probably was maybe remote, and he knew nobody had seen it. All right? He goes, this must be the Son of God. So we have more testimony now coming from Nathaniel. Then, and we're going we're gonna to hopscotch through the book in order to just cover these real quick. Um, the Son of God performs miracles. All right? The Son of God performs miracles. So, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 is what is called Jesus' first sign, all right? Pointing to the fact of who he is. And this is turning the water into wine at Cana. Cana is C-A-N-A. -A, turning the water into wine at Cana. Now, I've told this story multiple times, but I'm going to tell it again because it's just the truth and it's too good for me not to. When I was in uh, an intensive, a week long at Liberty, and I had understanding Hebrew language tools, and my professor was Ron Giese. All right, it's the hardest class I ever took. Not because Ron's a bad instructor, 
It's because I'm horrible with languages, all right? So they're really hard for me. But every morning he did a devotional. And they were just light you up devotionals. This guy is, is a great communicator of truth. So he says, one morning, he says, you know, for Christ's first miracle, I kind of really hoped it would be something better than this. Like maybe levitate the whole house. You know, make it shake. And I was like, I can't believe he just said that. It seemed a little bit almost sacrilegious. You know, he's, he said, but, you know, something really, really dynamic. He said, but let me point out some things. And which he did. And first of all, number one is there were six pots filled with water for washing and purification purposes that are going to be changed into wine in this story as we see. That is 120 or more gallons. Okay, we're, we're not talking about when, you know, we see a pretty picture that's for sale at the art and craft place, and you go, oh, that'd be cute on the kitchen table. This is six 20-gallon minimum. Everybody agrees they're at least 20 gallons. Some say up to 30 gallons. But these are ceremonial washing water, okay? Because as we've discussed in the past weeks, there is washing of the hands is very important in this time period. And even today, with the Orthodox Jews and actually practicing Muslims, they do lots and lots of washing, all right? It's ceremonial, and it is one of the things that takes lots of water. That's the kind of water this was. This was not drinking water. This is washing water. It is also designed for washing utensils and so forth, all right? So I want you to see the quantity of this. The other thing is the idea of taking non-drinking containers filled to the brim with non-drinking water and changing it into the best tasting drinking wine shows the transformational power in this one sent from God. All right? The fact is, is that he transforms the ordinary and the mundane into something wonderful and useful. All right? So it should be no surprise that he can take sinful mankind, touch and transform us and make us something useful and beautiful in his sight, in God's sight. But I want you to look at a couple of verses of why Ron Gysi says this miracle was more astounding in a biblical perspective than what I gave it credit for until you look at some of these verses. So take a look at Genesis 49. If you don't want to get there, I'll read it for you because of time. It says this. <clears throat> Number, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Folks, this is messianic predictions of coming times. This is talking about Jesus Christ. The next verse says this, he ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. What it is talking about is wine so abundant that you could literally wash your clothes with it instead of drink it. Okay? We're talking about a someone who had studied scripture would go, interesting, these washing pots and connecting to Genesis 49, but that's not the only place. I'm only going to go two places. Uh, there's more. As we went through the prophets, we saw this more than once. Uh, Joel 2 says this, So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and latter rain as before. Verse 24, listen to this, The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. All right, messianic prediction of what's going to happen when Messiah comes. Wine will be so abundant, it'll be like you can wash your clothes in it, all right, because of the blessing of Jesus Christ. So when he changes these ordinary six water pots, and he said, fill them to the brim, all right, you understand what that means is there's no trick to this. There's no additive that could have been put in, all right? And Jesus does it without him touching anything. Again, he speaks, and it happens. Just like Genesis 1, he spoke, 
God speaks, and the creative agent, Jesus Christ, the Word, accomplishes creation. All right? It's a beautiful picture of coming Messiah. Um, transformational power. Then, in Cana, once again, second miracle, he heals from a distance with his spoken word. The son of an official who lived in Capernaum. So the son of the official, and for the sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, in order to get this done in two weeks, I'm going to paraphrase. He comes to Jesus and says, man, you got to come. you got to come heal uh, my son. And Jesus says, your faith has made your son whole. He's fine now. And he said, go and see. He goes to Capernaum. He talks to his servants. His servants say he got better at whatever time. And the official went, that's the exact time Jesus said to me, he is healed. He healed from a distance. And by the way, isn't it interesting? The servants got a chance to be part of this, right? Because they got a chance to tell the official. And the official says, boom. And here's what I believe. I believe God reaches, Jesus reaches those servants with the good news of the gospel. He is the Son of God. He is deity. He is God in the flesh. All right? Then number C there, the third miracle. He heals a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. So quickly, the story there in chapter 5 goes like this. There is a pool there, and there was a time when their waters were stirred, and it says that the first that went in there were healed, and this man says to Jesus, I don't have anybody to put me in, so somebody always gets in before me. He'd been crippled since birth. All right? By the way, we blow past, crippled since birth, okay? He has never, ever been able to ambulate on his own, okay? I am so callous in my disregard for giving thanks to God for my health and ambulatory that this hits me like a ton of bricks. You know what? I've had some arthritis issues over the years that have caused me to have some issues where all of a sudden I had to use crutches for a time, all right? Even using crutches is just miserable, okay? But you still can move around. This guy was totally dependent on somebody else. You know what Jesus does? He says, pick up your mat and go. Paraphrase now. You know what he did? The guy goes, whoop, jumps up, picks his mat, rolls it up, puts it under, and starts to walk. Okay? This does not happen unless you are God in the flesh. All right? All of the nut job, Benny Hens, and all the other fleecers of people's money who are claiming to be healing people, they never get near anybody with any sort of real disability. All right? Because they can't heal. All right? You told the doctor said he wouldn't be able to pick up his mat right away and walk out the door. Correct. Even if we have a medical correctable situation, right? We got a nerve thing that's pinched, and we go, all right, we got surgery in the Middle East at the time of Christ. That kind of healing does not happen, all right? He gets up and he walks. Now, it's on the Sabbath. <laughs> so guess what? The relig religious elite, they're worked up about. Hey, why are you walking with carrying that man? You're not supposed to carry that. He goes, the guy who healed me said I could carry it and go, all right? So this guy is like, I'm just doing what the guy who healed me, and I've got a little more allegiance to him than you. <laughs> All right, paraphrase, yeah. but that's where he is at here. So let me get the blanks or I'll miss them. The healing is instant and complete as the man picked up his mat and walked. The healing was on the Sabbath, which caused a stir with the religious elite. And in this discussion, number three, Jesus in no uncertain terms did declares that he is doing the work of the Father. To state that you are doing the work of the Father is to literally say you are sent from God. So take a look at verse 18 of chapter 5. Actually, let me read 17. That tells us, But he answered them, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. 
Right? So you understand the religious elite saw what Jesus was claiming and said, he's claiming to be equal with God. You know what John the Baptist is saying? He is equal with God. That's why I wrote the book. Right? This is God in the flesh. Come to live among men to change our eternal destiny. Then the next miracle is the feeding of the 5,000 men in Galilee. That occurs in chapter 6. We've looked at that in previous Gospels, so uh, we'll blow past it, not because it isn't amazing, but just because of time. Then he walks on the Sea of Galilee is the next one in chapter 6. He walks on the Sea of Galilee. And I put in there, without ice chunks, as miracle-denying modern scholarship has suggested. I've actually read the nonsense of... Well, you know, it can get kind of cold in a hurry, and there's probably some floating ice, and he was walking on the... It's like, it takes way more faith to believe in floating ice chunks in the Sea of Galilee than it does to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh and can do the supernatural, all right? But that is what a blind, darkened heart refuses to acknowledge, who John says from verse 1, the Word is God, and the Word was with God, and was God, and became flesh and dwelt among us. In verse 14. Then he heals a man born blind in chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. All right, of all the senses that I've got, the one that scares me the most to lose is my sight. Of all the senses. You know, uh, I'm, I'm literally cringe when I think about losing my eyesight. Now, this man was born blind. He had never seen anything other than darkness. Didn't have any idea. Again, Jesus corrects this, and it is instant and complete. He heals this man and allows him to see. By the way, his miracles, fulfilling Isaiah 61. All right, Who is going to be this one? When he comes, he's going to preach the gospel to blind, poor, lame, brokenhearted, the down and out. Here's the thing. All of us are blind without hope until Jesus touches us and opens our eyes to the truth of God and His Word. All right? It's amazing to heal a blind man who's never seen. But it's more amazing to take blind, lost people like you and me and turn us into heaven-bound creatures solving our sin problem and releasing us from the sure coming wrath of God on unrepented sin. He heals a man born blind. Then, just in case you weren't getting it, in chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. All right? Mary and Martha were Lazarus' sisters. They said, hey, come. They said for Jesus, come. Lazarus is sick unto death. Jesus tells the uh, disciples, ah, oh, we'll go in a few days. And... He gets there four days after Lazarus has been buried. Okay? So last week we saw that the widow of Nain, I think it was last week, the widow of Nain, yes it was, is has lost her husband. Now her only son has died. And we talked about the vulnerability of a woman now without a husband and with no son in that time period. Even today in the Middle East, be a very vulnerable place for a woman to be. And Jesus touches the coffin and speaks, and the boy arises from the dead. All right, that was fresh, because the Jews, even today, you get buried within 24 hours. Um, you know, there's no embalming in, in Judaism, and so it's, it's quick. But in this case, we have a Lazarus dead four days, to the point when Jesus comes to the place where the tomb is, the concern is, it's going to stink if we roll that stone away. It's going to smell, all right? Decomposing body, I've never smelled a human one, thankfully, but I've smelled many an animal. Wow, that is nasty stuff, you know? Uh, a dead animal decomposing is nasty. Um, and they were concerned about the stench. Well, what happens is, look at chapter 11, verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God. We see it again. Even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and calling for you. Well, Jesus then goes on to walk up to the tomb, and the blank number one is Jesus states, I am the resurrection and the life. And then at the power of Jesus' words, Lazarus come back, comes back to life. It says this, When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. All right? So now we see Lazarus come stumbling out of the grave. He has to be stumbling because he's wrapped in the death burial clause, and he needs to be unwrapped. So he's got to come stumbling out. One Puritan preacher says, if Jesus went to clarify Lazarus come forth, he would empty out the whole cemetery because he has power over death, all right? He can bring the dead back to life. That's illustrated here. So he calls Lazarus, Lazarus comes out, um, and they unwrap him, and Lazarus is going to testify now, yeah, I was the one who was dead and then went back to life, all right? Side light. Jesus didn't raise a whole bunch of people from the dead. He healed lots and lots of infirmities. Lots and lots of people were healed with blind, disease, demon-possessed, hearing, uh, crippled, all kinds of things. He did not raise many from the dead. So I once heard Piper, John Piper, talking about this, and he said, he said, you know, I, I've often thought, why didn't Jesus raise more from the dead? Because that seems like to be the most astounding sign. All right? And here's what Piper said. Piper said, you know what I suspect? I suspect it's really no fun to die. It's not fun, the process of dying. And the ones Jesus rose from the grave, they died again. They actually died twice. <laughs> okay, so his thing, just the grace and mercy of God, it's like, I'm showing I have power over, but maybe it was because dying once is hard enough, dying twice is no picnic, okay? And I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting thought. All right, so that's raises Lazarus from the dead. Then in chapter 21, the catch of 153 large fish after his resurrection is detailed. Now, what happens is Jesus is on the shore and he calls out. They can't quite see who it is. And he tells them to throw their nets over on the other side. And they do. They fished all night and caught nothing. And then all of a sudden, they catch this monstrous. The nets are full. And when they got to shore, they count them. And John gives us that count. It's 153 large fish. And you know this isn't a fish story because none got away. All right, it isn't the one that got away. It is the nets didn't break, and they've got 153 large fish. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to give one thought. The similarity to an earlier miracle where Christ caused a great catch that was tearing the nets and sinking the boats would point to the one who on the shore, uh, who the one was on the shore from a distance. So Luke 5, Jesus has the, where he calls out, and he literally says, cast them out again. And they're like, who's this guy who thinks he knows everything, telling us how to fish? And they catch so many fish, it says they were tearing the nets. And as they were getting, the boats were getting so heavy, the boats were about to sink. Interesting here, John gives us this analogy and says, post-resurrection, this similar miracle occurs, 153 fish, nets aren't tearing, you get them all in. It's almost as if, to show us again the fact of the transformational nature of Jesus and his ability to take torn, broken, and make it whole and work perfectly well. It's almost picture of kingdom-like kind of uh, activity. Um, so I put the net is specifically noted to have not torn at all, is point number two. Well, then John chapter two, now we're jumping kind of back into, uh, instead of hopscotching, 
John chapter 2, the Son of God cleanses his house, calling it his father's house. So in chapter 2, he goes into the temple and overturns money changers and says, you're turning this into a house of thieves. Now, there's some scholars that say, oh, this is way out of order because Jesus did that right before he was crucified. All right, there's two solutions. One solution is, is that Jesus did this two different occasions, which is what I believe. I believe he did it here early in his ministry because John gives us a lot more detail about Jesus in Jerusalem. Because why would Jesus come to Jerusalem? His home was in where? Up here in Galilee. So Jesus spent the bulk of his time in miracles. Capernaum is home base. All right, Peter lived there. And that looks like they spent a lot of time in that area. So this is where he did the bulk of his miracles. Nazareth, up here. It's in the north. This is the north. Down here, way down here is where you get into Jerusalem. John talks more about Jerusalem stuff in his early ministry than the synoptics do. They all center here. John fills in with the things that happened in Jerusalem. Here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus went in and cleansed his father's house. And when he did, it people went like this. You know what they went? And went Who is this guy? And that's what they do. What does he think he is? So then, when we come to the week we're celebrating this week leading up to Easter, when he went back in the second time to overturn the money changers like he did in the Passion Week, you know what they said? We know who that is. Game on. We're killing him. All right? It was like the trigger to set the crucifixion into place. They knew who he was from the previous time he had done it, and they hadn't forgotten. All right? So when he came in and did it again, man, we're getting him this time. All right? The other solution to it is there's some good scholars who say John does not write chronologically, and so he's just he's giving this early here. He's not a chronological writer. I don't like it because there's different details in this one than there are in the one in Passion Week. That's why I think it's two separate, and I'm 100% right on that. All right? I'm at least confident I'm right. All right. Number six there, the Son of God proclaims He is the Savior from heaven. He proclaims it, chapter 3 in John, in the discussion with Nicodemus, he says this, No one, verse 13, has descended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. And then, of course, verse 16, for God so loved the world, the famous verse. And he goes on to talk about that this is, I am the one sent from heaven. I'm the one that is going to give you salvation. All right? You believe in me, you have eternal life. And so here we see the idea that he is indeed the Savior from heaven. And then... Uh, later in chapter 3, verses 22 and on, the Son of God owns all that the Father possesses. All right? He owns it all because He is God in the flesh. Number 8 there, He speaks His words. Verse 34, or 31, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of what he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He speaks his words, and number B there, he hangs on to all that the Father has given him. He hangs on to all that the Father has given him. He's going to repeat this claim again as we go in John. And we're going to stop there because of time, and then we will pick up next week to finish this book. But understand, when I make the comment, he hangs all on to all that the Father has given him, is a glorious truth. Because if my salvation... It dependent on my grip, I'm in trouble. All right? Because I have a tendency to be weak. I have a tendency to be sinful. I have a tendency to wander. If my salvation is dependent on my grip, 
My salvation is only as good as I am. Wow. So all my free will friends, as you head east, the more free will you get. The more you head to the beach, the sands of the sand hills become the sandy uh, belief system of eternal security. All right? If Jesus has a hold of me, he is going to hold on to me. Even when I'm doing like the spoiled, rotten little brat kid who is pushing away as dad's trying to hold for his own safety, even as I'm that whiny, pushing away kid, Jesus keeps a hold of me. All right? It is a glorious truth that the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who came to give his life and ransom for many, holds on to me when I repent and put my faith and trust in him. All right? We have people in this town, there's a pastor just down the road, in fact. I mean, he said it in Clint's presence. He said, well, if you're driving on the road and all of a sudden something happens in the car and you go and you you mutter an expletive, an inappropriate word that we all would say, that's inappropriate by any standard, and you get hit and die, you're on your way to hell. Because your salvation is only as good as your works. All right? You understand how enslaving and how crippling that is? Because you are not good enough to hold on to your own salvation. All right? But thank heavens, we have the Son of God, who, who the Father has given to me, I will in no wise cast out. And as we see, we'll see again, he's going to repeat it. The Father has given into my grasp, I will not let go. All right? The real issue is, are you in his grasp? All right? It is not, can he hold on to you? It is, do you have a real salvation. That's where the real issue is. If you are nothing more than a tithing, church-going Pharisee who holds on to the fact, look at me, I'm better than my neighbor, you don't have Jesus. All right? Repentance and faith is how you enter the kingdom of heaven, and that is crystal clear through all the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and it will be that case all the way through the entire book. Let's go in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I'm thankful for the Gospel of John that comes in and fills in so many details and fills in so many blanks and gives us such a rich tapestry of the cloth of which makes up the life of Christ. Lord, we are uh, reminded as we look at the perfect life of, life of Jesus how desperately we need him and how we are not capable in any way, shape, or form on our own. Lord, we confess that our sins are many and keep us from uh, having full fellowship often with you. And yet we're grateful that you have promised through the blood of Christ to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that each person here will examine their heart to make sure they are indeed in Christ's grasp and that they have fully surrendered their life to him. And Lord, may you help each one of us then to look for opportunities, even in this Passion Week, to express the goodness of Jesus in our lives to those around us. Lord, this is the time of year in our country when even many, many pretend believers feel a need to act or think about religion. May you help us to be ready to talk about the glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to open our mouths and to live in a way that points people to Christ while at the same time witnessing about your goodness to them. May you bless the service to follow and as Clint uh, speaks and as the music is sung, sung may we uh, honor and glorify you in all that we say and do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.